that is seemingly without compassion and that therefore is, let's say, very questionable and very off-putting to an individual who has himself or herself intelligence, consciousness, an innate morality, and looks at all of these things and will consider them very, very unfortunate and very reprehensible. So who is the God whom Christopher Hitchens and others are attacking. It is that particular God image. It is not the true God of the mystics, but it is the imperfect designer and creator of the lesser worlds. This is how, at least this is how the ancient visionaries who communed with these things have put it. So the notion of denying the existence of consciousness in and beyond creation because of the uh, imperfections of creation is not quite right either. So saying that there is nothing here or nothing beyond is, let's say, contrary to the, ultimately, to the data of experience. You know, I think in one of the Psalms, Maybe that's one of those psalms that originates in a better place. The saying is made, the, say it the fool, dixit incipiens in cordis uh, say it the fool in his heart, there is no God. You know? Well, uh, that is why it is foolishness to say that there is nothing there. If anything, there is too much there. There is all kinds of consciousness. There are all kinds of forces. And beyond these forces, there is something good, there is something true, there is something real. And there is a, um, an element, a uh, fragment, a uh, spark of that ultimate being, so these alternative mystical traditions say, in us. That is why we are able to conceive of it. That is why we are able to relate ourselves to it. That is why we are able to reach out toward it in prayer and meditation, in magic and in various ways, because deeply within us there is something that knows. Not just believes, but knows. See, this is the, this is the difference. That's why so much of what became conventional mainstream spirituality in our culture is based on belief. The euphemism for is faith. You know, if all of our politicians, oh yeah, I'm a man of faith, you know, or woman of faith, whatever the case may be, you know, and that faith is belief, you know. Well, belief is not the same as knowing. You can believe all kinds of things, and then you'll find out that they're not true, <laughs> right? But that there is a capacity within us to know, and that capacity exists because of a kinship in essence between the deepest self within ourselves and that ultimate consciousness from whence according to the seers and the sages we have come. And this creates an abiding, at least an abiding possibility of connection between us, bypassing even the powers of this demiurge who governs the world. It's interesting to note, for instance, you know, elements of this are present, especially in the New Testament, because it really takes, I think, very much of a brainwashed, either a brainwashed or a brainless person, not to perceive in the New Testament that the overall message of the New Testament and of the founder of the Christian religion, of Jesus, is very, very different from that Old Testament deity. Very, very different. Mercy, kindness, forgiveness, brotherhood and sisterhood, the underlying fraternity of the humans, these are the principles that are taught in the New Testament. There is no proof that the reference of Jesus to the Father is to the Old Testament deity. 
That is an assumption that was foisted on us, you know, later on. Oh, this might interest some of you. I have come across, as probably some of you have, especially those who are um, of that nationality, of a uh, Polish saint of, I believe, the very early 20th century. And that's Maria Faustina Kozlowska. And I've been reading some of her statements which were based on her communications with Christ. Mm -hmm. In one position, what does Christ say? Christ says to this saint, to this visionary, if you pray to me, and then Maria Kozlowska sort of designed certain prayers that are supposed to help this at the time of your death, I will stand between you and the Father without judgment and everything will be forgiven. Hmm? Doesn't that indicate that there is a, a discrepancy between the two? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the father, he is, doesn't say my father, he says the father. You know? hmm? The indication is here again, as it so often is in the visions of the saints and of people of great spiritual vision, that while there is a power here that is very judgmental, that is very unforgiving, that is very harsh, there is something that can come from beyond that power. And that the great messengers of light, including the last great one, Jesus Christ, are of that order. And they bring, we see the Jewish term for it is mercy. <laughs> the Buddhist term for it is compassion. But that is what they bring, and not the judgment. You know, he called the judge was not written about, about the good messengers of light. <laughs> not at all. Now, let's just, uh, in as much as our time moves along with us greatly, you know, this is the basic sketch. I think the answer to the uh, anger and concern of the new atheists, as well as probably of the old atheists, is to come to recognize what kind of theos <laughs> are we talking about here. Once I'm again, I'm, I'm reminded of really the really cute story of, that I encountered with my late landlord, my, my landlord on this apartment house in Hollywood, the old Russian Jew, very nice old man. He's, he died at almost the age of 100. And uh, he knew that I was involved in religious matters and things like that. And then uh, after he had some, he had some kind of sort of dangerous experiences, he came up to me one time, he said, say, say, he said, I'm an atheist, I'm an atheist, that's what he always is. I'm an atheist, oh, I thought, that's fine, I said, okay. He said, but tell me, what's going to happen to me after I die? <laughs> what's going to happen to me after I die? <clears throat> so I said to him, well, look, Mr. So-and-so, let me just tell you what I think. I think that where you are going, they are not going to care whether you had been atheist or not. <laughs> That's not going to figure in the equation at all. You were a good man, you did you know, you know, do good things, you took care of your family, everything. Those things will be more important. I, are you sure? Are you sure? Well, I'm reasonably sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, again, what was this man saying, as so many of them? I said, well, I'm... I'm an atheist, but at the same time, there is something else, right? I'm just he, well, the atheist because he couldn't believe in the God that was held up to him as the God, and therefore, in that sense, he was an atheist. So there is no reason, I think, for a person of consciousness and for a person who sincerely tries and perhaps also ultimately succeeds in intensifying and raising his or her consciousness to be a total denier of divinity. But it is incumbent upon such a person to recognize that much that passes in religion and elsewhere as God is not really God, but some kind of intermediate consciousness. Once again, I have no investment in personalizing these things. Many of them, of course, I mean, the one way to express visionary reality is in mythological form, because 
That's about the only way that you can do it. That's the only language that is halfway adequate to the kind of perceptions that the great seers have. That's why they don't come forth and talk about data and facts, you know. The seers and the sages, the prophets, the shamans are not computers, you know. Uh, <laughs> they are not concerned with giving you concrete information. They are concerned with giving you intimations of a reality that is beyond this world. And that's not easy to do. That's why a lot of, right? a lot of people have highly unusual, insightful experiences in this world. I, I met a lot of them. And you know, they didn't talk about it, only under the most private uh, circumstances. They were very, very shy about it and very careful about it, primarily because they